Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, a pan-cancer view of immune cell activity, immune checkpoints, and tumor mutational burden. I'm Mike Christel, Managing Editor for Applied Cl Clinical Trials, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by ACT and sponsored by Q-Squared Solutions. Q-Squared Solutions is a leading clinical trial laboratory services organization with end-to-end -end laboratory services and secure enterprise-wide biospecimen and consent management solutions. With a relentless focus on quality and innovation, Q-Squared Solutions uses its global experience and scientific expertise to transform science and data into actionable medical insights that help customers improve human health. A joint venture of IQVIA and Quest Diagnostics, Q-Squared combines the best of each parent's organization's clinical trial laboratory services capabilities to fulfill its mission of treating each sample as if a life depends on it. To learn more, visit www.q2labsolutions.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. Uh, you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. We will aim to respond to as many of your questions as possible. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The, slide, the slides will advance automatically during the event. Uh, please also take advantage of the resources provided by our sponsor located in the green resource widget on the dock at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget. It's in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Before I introduce today's speaker, um, we would like to ask our audience to participate in the first of our three brief polling questions. Please click and enter your answers directly onto the screen. Okay, our first polling question. Are you involved in clinical trials for immunotherapies? So it's a simple, uh, just a simple question. Are you involved in clinical trials for immunotherapies? Yes or no? Give the audience a few seconds to respond. Once again, a question, are you, are you involved in trials um, testing immunotherapy drugs, yes or no? And as you see, the, the results there are pretty, pretty overwhelming, um, a yes, from our audience. So um, definitely good to see that. All right, thank you for participating in our first poll. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Wendell Jones. Dr. Jones is Principal Bioinformaticist and Scientific Advisor at Q-Squared Solutions EA Genomics. His background includes analysis development and validation of the bioinformatics systems that process complex genomic assays, including next-generation sequencing assays, evaluating new and emerging genomic technologies, and developing bioinformatic implementation strategies. Dr. Jones has over 16 years of experience in advancing genomic technologies and 21 years of experience in scientific and technology leadership positions. Dr. Jones is also faculty adjunct in the School of Medicine in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. It is on the board of directors and is the current vice president of the Massive Analysis and Quality Control Society. He is also co co he is the author and co-author of over 50 uh, peer-reviewed publications in genomics and engineering. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Jones, for joining us today. Uh, you have the floor. And thank you, Mike, for that introduction. Uh, so, uh, good morning to you in, uh, in the Americas. Good afternoon to you, those of you in Europe and Africa. And I assume good evening if you're staying up late, uh, in, in Asia and, uh, the Pacific. So I'm going to be talking today, uh, about a pan cancer view of immune cell activity, uh, which includes immune checkpoints as well as tumor mutational burden. Uh, and so I'll get right into the presentation. Uh, just briefly, uh, Mike gave a overview of Q-squared solutions. So I work in the EA Genomics division of Q-squared solutions. And uh, historically, you may uh, know us as Expression Analysis. Uh, we were a company that started back in 2001. I won't go through the long history other than to let you know that uh, we do have uh, a great deal of experience in genomics, uh, beginning with uh, being one of the first uh, independent laboratories to do uh, asymmetric gene expression arrays 
lead into next-gen sequencing and having leadership positions in RNA sequencing to the acquisition by Quintiles, now called IQVIA, and then the creation of the uh, joint venture that Mike discussed earlier, Q-squared Solutions. I do want to highlight that we recently achieved uh, New York CLIA certification in oncology molecular testing for our uh, comprehensive cancer panel, and uh, we're excited to have uh, that. So it's a big milestone for our laboratory. Okay, well, let's uh, give an overview of the presentation today. I'm going to give a quick background on tumor immune activity in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, I'll provide some motivation for uh, immune signatures uh, that we're, we will discuss that are, are important to uh, understand outcomes uh, in, uh, in uh, different indications in clinical trials. Uh, I'll give a background regarding the immune landscape development uh, for those signatures. I'll talk about applications uh, that they have, including association with key endpoints and response to therapy. Uh, I'll also, uh, after that, uh, define a tumor mutational burden and discuss the relationships between uh, these immune landscape signatures with tumor mutational burden, and then I'll provide a, a summary. So just a, a, a fairly quick background, even though this is a very complex subject. Uh, obviously, uh, most of you know that there is a, a dynamic interaction between the immune system and uh, tumors. Uh, as you also know, uh, cancer cells adapt and uh, often avoid host immune control as a means of uh, promoting their growth and survival. Uh, what may not be as well known is that the tumor immune response can be expressed by measuring gene expression uh, of subcomponents of the immune system. Uh, certainly there's a history of doing this uh, with uh, immunohistochemistry and related technologies, uh, but we can also do that with uh, gene expression using RNA-based assays, and these potentially have uh, applications as biomarkers to predict response to different therapies, including immunotherapies. Over the last two years, we've been investigating these signatures, uh, in, including uh, complex multigenic signatures as well as individual genes, uh, so that we can determine their, their value uh, in terms of uh, 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 understanding both mechanism and their predictive behavior, uh, given these uh, solid tumors uh, and measurement of the tumor microenvironment. And I guess you could say we focused on trying to uh, in, in have enhanced signatures that have the ability to predict or explain variation in important endpoints, such as patient response to therapy and disease-free and overall survival. Uh, in multiple solid tumor indications, not just a particular one. So uh, again, what's a little bit different about this is these are RNA-based, and they've been optimized for explaining variation in patient response. And I think another important aspect is that uh, they are multidimensional, and they can also uh, be used in combination. In other words, uh, sometimes uh, understanding the, uh, uh, the immune system requires a multidimensional view, and this gives you the opportunity and the, the ability to uh, to examine those uh, uh, multi-dimensions. Now, I also had a specific motivation in that I first began working this area with some colleagues at Levine Cancer Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. They were interested in uh, uh, understanding patients who were durable responders to standard chemotherapy in high-grade uh, serous ovarian cancer. And ovarian cancer has actually some interesting properties related to uh, uh, treatment in the sense that the majority of patients do actually respond to platinum-based therapy, but then often recur uh, in one to two years. However, a subset of these patients have a durable response. Uh, another interesting aspect is this cancer is often viewed as being an immune desert. Uh, and uh, in terms of tumor mutational burden, it's viewed sort of in the lower to middle spectrum relative to other tumors as far as its overall uh, mutational burden. It has some cancer driver events that are in common with breast cancer. Uh, and also, interestingly, the TCGA main paper on ovarian cancer identified an immunoreactive subtype from RNA, but we're not able to associate this subtype with better patient outcomes. So having said that, uh, my collaborators and I went sort of back to uh, basics, and we, uh, we examined uh, a particular paper uh, by Newman and Nature Methods in 2015, that the so-called CyberSort paper, not for necessarily the intention of using CyberSort, but for 
uh, getting access to the set of genes associated with specific uh, immune cells and immune subcomponents. Uh, and so the graphic on the right represents the 22 different uh, 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 collections of cells and genes associated with those cells. Sometimes genes express in more than one of these uh, particular subtypes of cell. Uh, and so we were interested in that, and we're also interested in other publications that came out about the same time. Uh, and then we examined that uh, uh, information along with corresponding data we had in our laboratory to, uh, to determine uh, what might be a, a appropriate basis uh, in which to examine immune cell expression uh, in the tumor microenvironment. However, even though we started out with ovarian cancer, we also wanted to take a pan-cancer view. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so related to that, the other things that we uh, emphasized in, in our uh, history was creating a robust signature that often implied being multigenic in, in nature and, and sometimes having more than one signature, as you'll see. Uh, and also, uh, if you do it pan cancer, potentially it has the ability to apply to other indications. Uh, and then, uh, of course, another aspect is we wanted to use uh, trusted, well-curated data. Uh, and fortunately, TCGA was a great uh, resource for that. Uh, we had used it for uh, other contexts related to understanding mechanism of action of tumors. But here we were going to use it. Instead, instead of examining the immune cells to examine, I'm sorry, instead of examining the tumor cells, to examine the immune cells within the tumor microenvironment. And of course, the TCJ has some well-curated RNA-seq data for over uh, or almost 30 uh, distinct solid tumors. Uh, the other thing that we decided to do is, if, if you've worked with TCJ data, you may know that uh, there are certain cancers that, in essence, are overrepresented. Uh, for example, breast cancer is more than 1,000 specimens, but others only have 1 to 200. So what we did is we decided to do a random sampling by indication of up to 200 specimens so that we wouldn't have uh, signatures that were only representative of a few cancers. We really wanted to have something that was a pan-cancer view. So we put that information together. That is the immunome. If you remember that graphic that I showed you just uh, a few moments ago, uh, which is now in the top left corner of the 22 different types of immune uh, cells, combined with the almost 30 different TC TCGA indications that you see in the top right, uh, we were able to generate this heat map. And this heat map was suggestive of a couple of things. First off, uh, you see the uh, immunome genes organized on the left, and there's an organization structure in there that I'll talk about in just a moment. But you also see that when you look at the entire immunome, uh, when you look at the cancers, which are uh, in each column, there's still a great deal of organization by cancer, uh, except for more or less in the middle where you see the, the TN natural killer cell annotation where there seems to be less uh, uh, tumor-specific or tissue-specific types of of, uh, of uh, delineation. So we decided to uh, uh, identify this focus set and, and understand a little bit more about that. And, and so I'll, I'll bring out this focus set to, uh, to describe it a little bit more. But uh, what we noticed about this focus set uh, was that it had unusual organized activity across several different important immune cell types. Uh, and so uh, that gave us an indication that it that it may be uh, an important indicator of, of, of uh, potentially co-expression, or at least uh, possibly also co-regulation, uh, or at least uh, uh, common uh, cell uh, subtypes uh, within uh, you know, different uh, uh, tumors. So we decided to separate this set of genes and recluster the tumor samples to see if there was a different type of organization, and also to understand how mixed the tumors were. And so when we do this, uh, you see, in one sense, uh, a related but much different graphic where uh, all of a sudden the tumors now separate into pretty much tumors that are immunogenic or hot tumors versus ones that are not. Uh, and also you see that the uh, specific indications are less organized across the, the top of the, the heat map. Uh, related to the, the gene set uh, on the left, you see that there's different organizations uh, by the different colors, and these actually have some important properties. So for example, in the middle of it all seems to be uh, a set of genes that are primarily associated with T effector cells and CD8 T cells, which was the basis for our, our CD8 T cell signature. Uh, surrounding that are other genes that are often associated with natural killer cells, and so we developed this more general cytotoxic lymphocyte immune signature, uh, or CLIS, uh, that represents this larger set of genes. 
And there's also uh, a B-cell signature uh, just below that, as well as the uh, polarization of the macrophage. So there's an M1 signature uh, at the top part of the graph and an M2 TAM signature uh, at the bottom part, and then finally uh, also a dendritic cell signature. So this is a, a very descriptive uh, or a descriptive representation of this particular heat map. You can see there's also some other genes uh, that are important that uh, often don't fit into particular uh, subgroups such as FOXP3 and CTLA4. Uh, LAG3 is, is another one. But other genes like PD1 do fit into uh, existing signatures, as you would expect, because PD1 is expressed at the cell surface of, of uh, T cells. Okay, so one thing we noticed about both those genes and about the, the different uh, signatures is they fit into this general framework where you have what I call the yin and yang of uh, the uh, immune system in the tumor microenvironment in that there are uh, different aspects of the immune system that are responsible for uh, adaptation and attack uh, related to uh, tumor cells, specifically CD8 T cells and, and some related cells, including natural killer cells. Uh, there's uh, obviously indicators related to uh, a pro-inflammatory response, such as the M1 macrophage. But then there's also uh, aspects of the immune system that are more related to immune regulatory aspects, such as uh, autoimmune modulation, uh, T cell regulatory genes, uh, potentially other immune uh, suppression uh, 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 cells and, and genes that are reflective of immune suppression, as well as the uh, immune checkpoints. So in one sense, you have the yin and yang going on. And actually, it's important to understand all of these aspects as it relates to potential for uh, patients to uh, do well uh, uh, related to their uh, particular tumor. So, so I mentioned those as being a description. So the question is, do these actually have application? Do they actually segment uh, patients into uh, patients who have better outcomes versus uh, ones that don't? So here's the example with ovarian cancer. If you remember, I mentioned that in ovarian cancer, uh, that was the cancer where uh, in the original TCGA paper, they were not able to associate the immunoreactive subtype with a better outcome. But here, when we look at both overall survival on the left and event-free survival or time to recur on the right, uh, when you examine two of the signatures, which is the cytotoxic lymphocyte immune signature uh, versus the M2TAM, and you, uh, in essence, arrange them in terms of, of uh, order such that uh, the top quartile reflects patients who have high levels of cytotoxic lymphocytes and low levels of the M2TAM uh, cell type versus the opposite, you know, the fourth quartile where they may have low levels of cytotoxic lymphocyte and higher levels of M2TAM. You see that there's actually a very significant differentiation uh, actually along all the quartiles uh, for both overall survival and, and event-free survival. So this is, uh, as far as I know, one of the first examples of immune signatures being applied to ovarian cancer. Again, a cancer that is often viewed as an immune desert, but obviously uh, uh, the immune system seems to play a, a large role in outcomes both for event-free and overall survival. As far as applying to uh, other cancers, there's a, uh, in one sense a related cancer, endometria cancer, where uh, in this case I've broken it up by early stage versus late stage or advanced stage endometrial cancer. Uh, again, data also from TCGA where you see, again, high cytotoxic lymphocyte activity. Uh, if you're in early stage, that often yields the best outcome. But if, even if you're in advanced stage, the advanced stage high lymphocyte activity is more or less equivalent to uh, having a lower level of cytotoxic lymphocyte activity at early stage. So if you're able to catch the cancer early, or if it's advanced, but you have high cytotoxic lymphocyte activity, again, similar profiles related to overall survival. And again, the worst profile is related to uh, low cytotoxic lymphocyte activity in advanced stage. And there are many other examples of this. This is one with uh, bladder cancer, uh, looking at the, uh, in this case, the M1 to M2 TAM ratio. Uh, again, similar kinds of, of behavior. Uh, this is early stage bladder cancer versus uh, the late stage, which I showed previously. And here, a different dynamic seems to, to be going on, where instead of looking at cytotoxic lymphocyte activity, it actually may be more important to look at uh, the CD28 to CTLA4 ratio, which is an important uh, immune checkpoint, as many of you know, in that if you have a high ratio of CD28 expression to CTLA4 uh, in early stage, that often yields a better outcome than if you have the uh, opposite. 
and uh, similar uh, dynamics can, can be seen for breast cancer. This one's kind of interesting in the sense that uh, uh, this is overall survival split up by mutational burden or mutational load. Uh, and on the left, you're seeing a survival profile of uh, uh, breast cancer patients who have high mutational load where high cytotoxin lymphocyte activity is clearly a, a big differentiator there. But even when you go to low mutational load, it may not be the same type of signature, but in context with other important indications like uh, this PAM50 proliferation score, uh, the M1 to M2 TAM ratio can often differentiate uh, survival curves uh, in those patients as well. And we can go on, and here's, again, another one involving kidney cancer. Uh, uh, here's pancreas and a carcinoma, a similar type of thing. These immune signatures are separating. Here's one where B cell activity uh, is uh, separating the different groups in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, and then also in melanoma. So all that's very interesting, uh, but I guess this is one way of summarizing it. So, so before we were looking at Kaplan-Meier curves of survival. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm doing a little bit more sophisticated analysis using uh, multivariable Cox proportional hazards models. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm examining these immune signatures in the context of other key important clinical parameters, such as age, uh, stage, residual disease, uh, and potentially other uh, factors such as type of treatment that may be variable, uh, for uh, certain indications such as breast cancer based upon uh, other diagnostic tests uh, uh, for the patients. So, uh, so the important thing here is, is showing you that these different immune signatures that I've talked about before, starting with the cytotoxin lymphocyte immune score, going through with CD8, the M1 macrophage B cell, some individual genes uh, that are important, uh, the M2 TAM signature, and then combinations of those, like the M1 to M2 TAM ratio, uh, often these are predictive of outcomes, whether it's event-free survival, uh, overall survival, or response to therapy. Uh, many of these are TCGA studies. Some of these are studies outside of TCGA uh, that either I've been directly involved with or, uh, or have data that, that are public. And so you see this pattern where, you know, for example, many tumors do show better outcomes uh, where higher levels imply less risk or, or better outcomes. Uh, those are the ones in green. And then uh, there are other indicators like M2 TAM in particular where higher levels are often associated with worse outcomes. But it's not necessarily a, a given for every single indication. And there are some indications such uh, as the early stage uh, renal cell uh, uh, clear cell carcinoma where there are many fewer uh, immune signatures that are predictive, yet at least one of these signatures is predictive in all of these, you know, particular indications. So the lesson here is that often cytotoxin lymphocyte and related activity is predictive of better outcomes. However, that's not the case in every cancer, and we have to treat uh, not only every cancer potentially differently, but we also have to take into account the other important clinical parameters that are often associated with that particular cancer, whether it's different treatment modalities or uh, specific things such as an ovarian cancer where a common method is to do surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. What was the, uh, what was the status of the patient after surgery? Was there residual disease present or not? These things are also important in terms of understanding outcomes. And with that, I think we're ready for the uh, next polling question, Mike. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, now ask our audience to participate in our second poll question. Please click and enter your answers directly on the screen. You'll see there that the question reads, are you currently using or considering using biomarkers such as MSI status, TMB, or immune status to select patients or retrospectively analyze patients in oncology or immuno-oncology trials? Yes or no? Once again, the question, are you currently using or considering using biomarkers such as MSI status and others retrospectively? Um, you'll see the, you'll see the uh, results there on the screen. Yes, 82%. No, about 18%. Thank you for participating in our second poll. I will now send it back to Dr. Jones. All right, thank you, Mike. 
Sure. So obviously many of you are very interested in uh, uh, the use of biomarkers in clinical trials. So I just wanted to say that related to these immune landscape signatures, it is uh, a product. Uh, so we do offer these uh, as uh, as uh, potential biomarkers to explain uh, response to therapy and variation in, in patient outcomes in clinical trials. We currently uh, associate uh, data such as this with 11 immune cell subtypes uh, or individual genes or ratios uh, of different uh, immune signatures because sometimes the ratios of these uh, different signatures are also important. That is, how much do you have of one relative to another? These include, again, the cytotoxal lymphocyte uh, immune signature, signatures for CD8 T cells, B cells, M1 and M2 TAM macrophages, regulatory T cells, some important individual genes, as well as the checkpoints. As you saw, some of the checkpoints are often uh, highly predictive of uh, either uh, response to therapy or overall uh, survival. And depending on the platform, it could be other key genes may be available also, such as uh, TGF-beta and IL-10 that are often associated with immunosuppressive features. But the main thing is that you know, we've, we've uh, independently assessed these signatures in, in 20 large, distinct solid tumor data sets. Uh, and we've tried to ensure that they have relevance and predictive capabilities uh, independent of other clinical factors, or I should say also in the presence of other clinical factors. So, so these signatures aren't just reflecting the typical uh, clinical parameters, and in fact, they also are indicating information above and beyond what you get with tumor mutational burden, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, in just a minute. Uh, right now, uh, we feel like these immune signatures are a separate important dimension uh, to understanding patient response and survival. And currently, they're measured on a continuum. But for diagnostic purposes, uh, as, as we get into specific indications, we can determine the appropriate thresholds uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to, you know, to turn the, the uh, signature into a, a final biomarker. So related to the product as it exists now, it's more set up, again, as uh, uh, a tool to determine what are the appropriate uh, endpoints uh, to e examine and the uh, thresholds to set for particular signatures, but the uh, the signatures come in both raw scores and standardized form. Uh, the standardized scores are useful when doing tox proportional hazards models to uh, be able to compare hazard ratio estimates. Uh, hazard ratio estimates would, would be difficult to interpret if you didn't standardize uh, the data in some fashion. So we go ahead and provide that standardization so that you, when you do look at these more complex multivariable uh, cost proportional hazards models, they are ready to go and you can interpret hazard ratios and, and it's a lot simpler. Uh, and then we also uh, provide uh, information on individual genes. Uh, and we can do this across a, a variety of platforms. So uh, obviously a lot of the original data was derived using uh, RNA sequencing either of uh, other uh, outside of TCGA data sets or using TCGA itself. Uh, but we've also used these immune signatures with uh, nanostring uh, in different types of panels and also with HTG. And so we feel uh, very confident that these immune signatures can be actually implemented across a variety of platforms. Uh, some of these are shown here, you know, either in, in blue or in green. Uh, and also, if you have historic data on microarrays, they can also be vetted with Affymetrix and Agilent microarray data as well. In fact, one of the data sets that you saw previously uh, was uh, an Agilent microarray data set. I've also worked with Affymetrix, where the same results uh, uh, show promise. Uh, also in ovarian cancer, uh, but also in other cancers as well. So the the important point here is it's it's flexible. Uh, these immune signatures can be implemented in a variety of platforms, and you can uh, you can uh, easily transition from something that's more investigative, like RNA sequencing or microarrays, to something that's more focused, like a nanostring or an HTG or, or related you know quantitative PCR panel, for example. Okay, well, I've talked a lot about mutational signatures, and now it's time to talk about tumor mutational burden. So uh, as many of you may know, uh, this is typically defined as the total number of uh, non-synonymous and silent uh, somatic mutations. And it's kind of interesting as why would you include uh, the silent mutations. Well, it turns out that the number of silent and non-synonymous mutations in coding regions is highly related. So, uh, uh, and 
you see the graph here, you know, over uh, 7,000 tumors where this data has been collected in TCGA, pain cancer, uh, very, very high correlation. This implies that there's a common mechanism that's really driving both. And, of course, I'll talk about that also in just a minute related to, uh, for example, uh, defects in, in DNA damage repair. But uh, obviously, whether you're uh, just counting the non-synonymous somatic mutations in coding regions or you look at both non-synonymous and synonymous or silent ones, uh, pretty much you're going to get the same uh, marker. Uh, it's just that if you include the silent ones, your counts go a little bit up, so it helps you in those uh, those tumors that have uh, a little bit less tumor mutational burden, you can get a, a, above the noise of the measurement a little bit faster uh, and therefore potentially get a more stable uh, uh, biomarker. And as you know, the TMB is also a well-known and documented biomarker in immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, this has been shown in a couple of papers, you know, recently, for example, in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, that uh, it, was, it was viewed that tumor mutational burden was a suitable biomarker for patient selection uh, in these uh, clinical trials for non-small cell lung cancer. And if you're somewhat familiar with tumor mutational burden, you may have seen this graph before. Uh, it first appeared in a paper by Lawrence, but more famously maybe in a paper by Alexandrov in Nature. And it just shows the spectrum that tumor mutational burden, uh, first off, does vary uh, over different uh, indications. Uh, it is, is higher, for example, in melanoma and different lung uh, cancers than it is, say, in various blood tumors uh, and, uh, uh, and other tumors such as uh, pancreas and, and uh, the brain cancers. But it also has a uh, wide range of variation. As you can see, it's measured on a log scale typically, and I'll be using log scale when you see uh, graphs of tumor mutational burden in just a moment. Uh, and so, uh, so again, uh, some of you may already be familiar with this, and the main thing is there's both variation within uh, a particular cancer, but there's also variation in the typical value of mutational burden across different cancers, and, and different cancers tend to have higher mutation rates uh, again, not surprisingly, in skin and, and lung, those are the most exposed tissues. Uh, in one sense, not surprising that they have higher mutational burden in general. So uh, in, in the, doing a simplistic graphic of TMB and DNA damage repair deficiency checkpoints and immune response, there is, you know, one view I think that is, is often viewed and we wish that life was this simple where in one sense you have a tumor cell that may have arose from you know, radiation or exposure or mutagens uh, that creates mutations by itself, obviously, and therefore increases mutational burden. But what really gets mutational burden going potentially is, is uh, defects in mismatch repair and other uh, uh, deficiencies in DNA damage repair. And when you combine that with cell division, you often see, you know, greatly increased, you know, this, this multiplicative amplification of mutational burden. And that shows up in a couple of ways. It shows up in higher mutational burden. It shows up uh, using MSI as a biomarker. And then in theory, because this often leads to a great, a greatly increased number of neoantigens, it's thought that this leads to uh, much uh, increased adaptive immune response. So this is a simplistic view. Uh, and when we look at actual data to back this up, we actually see uh, related to the DNA damage repair deficiency that that, in fact, is strongly connected to mutational burden. So on the y-axis, you have the average mutational load of these uh, DNA repair uh, genes uh, from TCGA. And then on the x-axis, you have the log mutational burden. And it's more or less summarized by indication. Uh, and this is from a couple of different uh, sources, including TCJ and a paper in Cell Reports this year. But uh, here you see there is, in fact, a high correlation between uh, DNA damage repair defects uh, and log mutational uh, burden. So that relationship that we saw before does seem to bear out. However, when we get to TMB and immune status, it is quantitative related, but it's just not as strong. So, for example, here's the same type of graph where log mutational burden is on the x-axis, and then uh, cytotoxic lymphocyte uh, immune score, one of the signatures that I showed you previously, is on the y-axis. And there is correlation, and it's certainly different from zero, but it's certainly not as strong as the connection between uh, DNA damage repair defects and, uh, and TMB. And in fact, if you were to uh, take out the uh, brain cancers, uh, the correlation goes down even further. 
Uh, and they, then again, this is summarizing it uh, at the typical level for any particular indication. Again, the, the different points reflect the different uh, solid tumors that uh, we were examining in, in TCGA. Uh, if you actually go down to the individual samples, uh, you see a much different picture. So now instead of actually summarizing it by indication, you're now actually visualizing the individual sample values for TMB and the cytotoxin lymphocyte score. And there, instead of being a high correlation, you in fact see the correlation is only about 0.2. And in fact, if you see the, notice the green points in the lower left part of the uh, scatter plot, those are all lower grade glioma tumors, which tend to uh, have uh, low mutational burden and low cytotoxin lymphocyte activity, uh, possibly because on the low cytotoxin lymphocyte activity, not necessarily because of mutational, low mutational burden, but because of other immunosuppressive features going on in ma many brain cancers. And in fact, if you remove the lower grade gliomas, the correlation at the individual sample level, pain cancer drops down to just 0.1. So, so the, obviously there's, there's much more going on related to uh, the tumor microenvironment and what's drawing cytotoxin lymphocytes to the site versus just mutational burden alone. And in fact, if you look at particular indications like here, uh, for example, the, uh, adeno, the lung adenocarcinoma is in magenta or light purple. Uh, the squamous cell carcinoma is in green. Uh, and if you look at mutational burden versus cytotoxin lymphocyte activity, basically there's zero correlation. Uh, they're, they're, in one sense, completely uncorrelated uh, related to each other. Uh, you get the same thing if you look at melanoma. Uh, again, melanoma is, is a disease that is very high in mutational burden in general, but also has a great deal of variation. Yet, high or low mutational burden does not predict uh, cytotoxic lymphocyte activity uh, in the tumor microenvironment. There's basically zero correlation. So, uh, so what's going on here? So, if we go back to the Alexandrov uh, graph, uh, which I showed you before, I'm going to show you, in essence, equivalent representation from TCGA. So in both of these graphs, we're looking at log mutational burden. Uh, and so, uh, and I've ordered both of them, or I shouldn't say I've ordered both of them. Alexandra, I've ordered them by the median level uh, up top. I've also ordered, organized the solid tumors in TCGA uh, by that as well. And so the question is, how do they compare? And uh, as expected, uh, you would expect that uh, uh, melanoma and uh, lung cancers are up top, which they are. As you go further down the list, it gets a little bit more uh, mixed. So in other words, there's general agreement between Alexandrov and uh, TCGA data, but there are some cancers like prostate that at least in TCGA seem to have a much lower mutational burden than what's suggested by Alexandrov. Uh, and then there's also ovarian cancer, which uh, goes from kind of the, being in the uh, middle to being a little bit higher in mutational burden, at least in TCGA data. But the most important thing is how does uh, this data, and the reason this data is so important is in TCGA, we have a panomics view. So we have not only measures of mutational burden for most of the tumors, but we have measures of RNA, uh, microRNA, uh, 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 epigenetic measurements, uh, even protein measurements for uh, many of the, of the cancers, but, but for a much more limited set of analytes. So here I'm actually showing you more or less cancer by cancer, the ordered mutational burden uh, that you just saw previously on the top part. And I'm showing you the equivalent uh, of the cytotoxin lymphocyte score for that cancer on the bottom. And there are some uh, notable discrepancies that, that come up. So for example, cervical cancer and head and neck cancer, uh, these often have higher cytotoxin lymphocyte activity than what would be suggested by a mutational burden. And in fact, we know that uh, cervical and head and neck cancers have a strong connection to oncogenic viruses, for example, uh, HPV. We also see that uh, renal clear cell carcinoma, uh, which is way down the list in terms of mutational burden, nevertheless is one of the highest levels of immune activity. And in fact, there's a recent paper uh, by Panda and, and JCO this year where they showed that renal clear cell carcinoma has strong ties to endogenous retroviral expression. Again, not something related to uh, uh, mutational burden, but uh, a different part of the DNA uh, that was evidently creating uh, an immune response. So, uh, and I'm not saying this is the most complete picture, but this at least is a more complete picture 
of TMB and immunogenicity in that, yes, you do have uh, DNA defects that drive uh, mutational burden. However, there are many things that can, uh, uh, that the tumor cell may be doing that may be either inhibiting uh, the presentation, for example, of those mutations. So, for example, many tumors often uh, have loss of heterozygosity in HLA uh, class 1 regions or they downregulate that region. Therefore, there's just not as many uh, of those being presented at, at, the cell for, at the cell surface. Or there's other general immune evasion techniques in, in terms of expressing uh, chemokines that uh, affect Tregs that downregulate the system or expressing TGF-beta. And then, of course, there's the, the ones that I mentioned that uh, in one sense are not directly related to mutational burden, such as viruses or endogenous retroviruses or uh, potentially intron retention. Those may be driving up immune response, but not directly tied to uh, mutational burden. So, uh, so the question is, if we go back to that graph that I had before about associating different key biomarkers with uh, outcomes, uh, in different types of cancer. Here I've added the line, that if you see the line in black there, where I'm looking at mutational burden as a predictor of outcome. And sure enough, mutational burden does, in the presence of age, stage, and residual disease, and many other indicators, often uh, predict outcomes in the sense that higher mutational burden often implies uh, less risk. But there are a few cancers where that's not the case. So for example, in colorectal cancer and overall survival, higher mutational burden does not necessarily correspond to, to better outcomes. But you also see there are other uh, cancers, for example, ovarian cancer, where mutational burden doesn't seem to be uh, predictive at all and has basically a white box related to ovarian cancer, as well as some others like head and neck and so forth. Uh, again, head and neck, um, Maybe a lot of the immune activity uh, is uh, related to uh, uh, viruses and other things and not necessarily driven by mutational burden. And mutational burden, therefore, doesn't necessarily give you a, uh, 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 a good indicator. So, uh, so the, the important point here, I guess, is that uh, if we look at TMB overall, we know that TMB is an established and important biomarker in immuno-oncology. Uh, it has been shown to have uh, good potential in uh, understanding uh, response to uh, certain therapies, especially uh, checkpoint-related therapies. However, uh, it, it could be that RNA assays may provide more information about the current, st current state of immune activity in the tumor microenvironment than TMB, and possibly also more predictive information, given that it's multidimensional, uh, in the sense that you get information about cytotoxic immune cell presence, you get information about inflammatory response, and you also get information about uh, immune regulatory systems and mechanisms, as well as checkpoints. I think the important point is that immune signatures are providing a different type of information from TMB. Uh, as you've seen from the correlation analysis, uh, TMB and immune signatures are not redundant, and in fact, uh, can be used jointly as biomarkers. In fact, uh, I can show you uh, several models where uh, both immune-related signatures and TMB in the same Cox multivariable model are highly significant, and melanoma, for example, uh, is one of those. So, uh, so related to that fact, you know, my own company even has a current uh, and developing methods for estimating uh, TMB, not just in the standard state where you have tumor normal pairs, but also when you uh, have tumor sample only or whether you're using whole exome sequencing versus large panels. Perhaps uh, we can also use large panels or potentially even RNA itself uh, to look at mutations and estimate uh, the equivalent of overall uh, tumor mutational burden. So I think the key thing is that both TMB and immune signatures may be important for any given indication and therapy. So just to summarize overall, when we look at the, these immune landscape signatures that we offer, they seem to be reflective of the multidimensional nature of immune response in cancer. Uh, each signature uh, we, that we've established has been statist statistically significantly associated with either treatment response, event-free survival, or disease-free survival in multiple indications. And not only that, not only are they significant, but they're also significant in the presence of of common clinical parameters such as patient age, tumor stage, residual disease, therapy type, even TMB and other clinical factors. Uh, and in fact, 
uh, recently we showed that uh, these uh, were uh, significant in association with treatment response for a particular immunotherapy, which I didn't have time to show uh, at this point. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I think it's important to, to point out that these immune signatures have application across uh, uh, many different areas, uh, response to therapy uh, being one of them. Uh, I think also it's important to know that they're available for a large variety of RNA-based assays. So it isn't something where we require that you have to have a particular platform in order to implement these particular signatures. Uh, they can be used for research use on a wide variety of platforms, uh, but also they can be easily ported to uh, CLIA-compatible diagnostic devices such as Nanostring and NHTG. So I think the important thing is whether you have historic data or whether you're working on developing data now, if you have an RNA platform that's measuring uh, these different immune genes, you know, that's something that can be used. Uh, and then we can then turn that potentially into a uh, CLIA compatible diagnostic uh, by porting it to a more specialized platform. Because that's the thing, we want these signatures to be robust. To be robust. We feel like they, we've built that in by um, making them multigenic in nature. We've shown that these signatures and outcomes uh, 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 or have association with outcomes in multiple indications across multiple platforms, including just about any way you can measure RNA. Uh, and they've been uh, tested with multiple independent sets. Uh, and in one case with ovarian cancer, multiple independent sets in the same indication. Uh, so for example, in ovarian cancer, I've actually validated the same signatures in four independent cohorts of ovarian cancer. Uh, some of which were, were shown here. Uh, and with that, I'll give it to uh, Mike, I think, for our last uh, – oh, I did, sorry, I did want to acknowledge a few people, my collaborators at Levine, as well as the bioinformatics department here, as well as the great data from the TCGA consortium, uh, where I was actually at a meeting there just over a week ago celebrating the, uh, uh, the accomplishments that TCGA was able to provide the, the community. And with that, uh, I think we get to our last polling question. Great. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, yes, our final polling questions you'll see there on the screen. It's asking, are you involved in oncology-related clinical trials, but not trials for checkpoint inhibitors, and are interested in understanding the potential role that a patient's immune status plays in their outcome? Yes or no? Give the audience a few seconds. Great, so you see the results are on the screen. About 70% yes, 30% uh, or so no. Well, thanks, Doctor, for that informal, uh, the, the very informative presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, we're now going to move into the uh, Q&A portion of today's webcast. Um, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You could submit them by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Okay, looks like the um, first question from the audience. How do your immune signatures compare to other immune signatures, signatures such as X-cell or protein-based signatures? Okay, Mike, that's an excellent question. So we have investigated other immune signatures, uh, such as uh, there was a publication uh, from a group at uh, UCSF, uh, I think just over a year ago, where uh, in essence, they, they tried to extend the ideas that Newman had in his paper to look at even more some components of the uh, immune compartment, uh, and they generously uh, uh, were, uh, provided that data for many of the uh, samples in TCGA. And so in, in looking at that uh, in, for example, ovarian cancer, uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, see that uh, even though you're looking at maybe more detailed level data uh, with, with Excel, that uh, we didn't get the same predictive capability uh, that we had with our own immune signatures. So, uh, so it's not saying that Excel is inaccurate or anything like that. It's not saying that at all. It's, it's the question of there are other immune signatures. I think they, they have relevance to uh, many different areas. Uh, I think that what differentiates what we tried to do is that we tried to ensure that whatever signatures that we came up with, that they were uh, predictive or highly associated with outcomes, important outcomes that 
uh, our, our clients are wanting to examine, which includes things like recurrence-free survival, re progression-free survival, response to therapy, and also, you know, are they prognostic as well? Are they indicative of overall survival? So that's, I think, the key difference between what we've tried to do. We're trying to have signatures that are also reflective of, of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, another question in from the audience. How do, you, how do your immune signatures um, compare with the immune subtypes identified in the paper, the paper that was in, uh, published in the journal Immunity, um, I think, uh, back in April? How, how, does, how do your signatures compare with the, those subtypes that were identified in that paper, the, the immune landscape of cancer? Yeah, so the immune landscape of cancer uh, was, uh, in one sense, a seminal paper looking at uh, uh, immune status across a wide variety of tumors in TCGA. And uh, if some of you are familiar with that publication, uh, you know that uh, they uh, associated uh, different tumors with a subtype. And, uh, you know, in general, I think subtyping is great for uh, classifying behavior overall, especially if you're looking at retrospectively, you know, what are most tumors, uh, what are they, uh, what are they like in terms of a characterization. However, um, what I would say is that uh, sometimes uh, if you force a particular multidimensional characteristic into one particular subtype, it can be somewhat like fitting a, a square peg into a round hole. Uh, and uh, and so just saying that, you know, a particular tumor is uh, uh, interferon gamma active, uh, that may be true, but the question comes to mind, okay, are there other uh, aspects of the immune system that are at play, including uh, immunosuppressive behavior? Uh, because we've seen that, again, related to the outcomes we've seen, the, the immune system is telling us something multidimensionally. Uh, and it's important to understand uh, those different dimensions when uh, trying to uh, assess outcomes for uh, a particular therapy or for patients. And so subtypes are good, but uh, I think it sometimes can be trying to narrowly classify uh, a patient's tumor microenvironment too narrowly without first looking at the variety of information that's available. Uh, so in one sense, I think it's very good, and it's a good characterization, and I, I know a lot of the people who worked on uh, the paper, and I trust them implicitly. They certainly know more about immunology than I do. But I think in terms of subtypes themselves for clinical trials, I would rather have the data behind it uh, that reflects the multidimensional nature of immune activity in the tumor microenvironment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that answer. Next question is asking, uh, do, do you have methods for assessing immune health? Yes, yeah, so I'm yeah. reading a little bit more of the, the question here. Yeah, uh, yeah so, um, so here I guess what I should say is this is, uh, if you like, an introduction into uh, immune status in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and I think these are very, very good uh, basic measures for immune status related to, uh, you know, immune health versus immune status. Uh, uh, for example, uh, I think the, the person here is examining responses of naive T cells to uh, CD3, CD28 beads. That I don't necessarily have uh, detailed knowledge of, but what I can say is that uh, we have used this as the uh, – uh, as the first step in uh, in relation to the clients to potentially uh, build better and more powerful signatures that are geared to their particular indication and therapy because uh, in one sense this is a, this is a very good tool but it, it's in one sense also a high level uh, for example just dendritic cells which I didn't really talk about at all uh, dendritic cells can play uh, an important role in some tumors and not only that but there are different Types of dendritic cells. Uh, they may have both pro. Some may have pro-tumor. Some may have anti-tumor characteristics. Uh, and so, uh, so related to, you know, assessing, you know, particular uh, aspects, uh, however it's defined, those can be refined based upon more detailed knowledge of uh, of a client's particular indication. So, uh, so I think in general, uh, we do have methods for uh, assessing. Uh, uh, 
whether it's immune health or uh, uh, even uh, finer subtypes of, of the immune compartment than what you see here. It's just that uh, we, obviously we only have an hour to, to go through some of this, so uh, we have to keep it at a high level. And, of course, one of the main things is showing you that uh, TMB and immune status are not synonyms. Uh, they're actually not the same, and, and that's an important thing that uh, needs to be understood by, uh, I think, by many. Uh -huh. Okay. Another question. Um, can you comment on how your signature correlates with response to IO agents, and specifically which tumor types have you tested? Okay, so I'm looking for uh, that particular question. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Mike, just repeat that. I, I thought I had it in front of you, but I don't. Just repeat the question. No, no, no again. problem. Uh, you have, uh, can you comment on how your signature correlates with response to immune oncology agents, and specifically which uh, which tumor types have you tested? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yep. so um, so we. We have uh, looked at uh, a few indications with uh, in clinical trials uh, where the uh, the clinical trial is immunotherapy agent. I can't unfortunately go into details because those are, are confidential, uh, but I can say that we have worked in uh, both uh, melanoma and mesothelioma, which are in one sense two very, very different cancers. Uh, in melanoma, you know, you know we, you saw some of the indications. Of course, melanoma is a classic for immunotherapy. Uh, mesothelioma is one that is not and, and often has a lower mutational burden uh, than many other cancers. Uh, and so, uh, but we have looked at uh, signatures uh, in, in those two contexts, but unfortunately I can't disclose those details. Uh, I can talk about the public data, uh, which are typically not uh, IO agents. Uh, at least in TCGA, you know, this is, these are samples that were collected and the follow-up was collected before uh, immune oncology uh, therapies were generally available. Uh, so unfortunately, that's the data that I can comment on publicly, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I can't describe uh, some of the uh, the uh, more recent information, unfortunately, but hope too soon, I guess, would be another way of putting it. Okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Another question, uh, can you describe how you differentiate TMB from MSI, MMR, or DRD signatures in your assays? That, that, that any perspective there? How you yeah, so, so typically with, you know, with TMB, uh, Right now, our, our assays for TMB are, are whole exome based, but we're rapidly progressing to a point where we can use, you know, a focused cancer panel to compute the equivalent of, you know, a genome-wide you know, mutational burden score. Uh, and uh, so, so TMB is typically done with with sequencing. You can do it with either whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, uh, or you can, you know, potentially do it with a focus panel if you can uh, get the right representation. Uh, related to MSI status, typically that's a, uh, a completely different assay, uh, but related in terms of the biological origin. But our MSI assays are more or less the standard assays looking at microsatellites, you know, looking at specific microsatellites and measuring those. Uh, and then the, was there a third part of the question? It was TMB versus microsatellite versus uh, there was one other part, Mike. I, I've forgotten the third part. Um, DRD? Oh, DRD. Okay. So currently, uh, uh, other than whole exome sequencing, we don't have a focused assay for DNA damage repair. Although, in one sense, it would be easy to uh, to create one. So, uh, because in one sense, you're just changing your uh, your bait set to look at the uh, you know the focused DNA repair, whether you're looking at the full. Uh, the full set of DNA repair genes, or whether you're focusing on like mismatch and non-homologous enjoying, or in repair, or, or things of that nature. So certainly, specific assays for DNA repair uh, can be uh, created. What I'm doing here, related to this particular presentation, was reflecting the results from TCJ, which used whole exome sequencing. Okay. Appreciate that. And maybe for a final question, uh, um, uh, you can address this uh, question. How many genes would you need in a focused panel to estimate TMB accurately? Wow, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I think um, there are uh, there are different thoughts about this. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that uh, that some would say you would need at least uh, a few, maybe uh, at least a hundred to a couple of hundred uh, uh, key genes that are representative uh, of this particular phenomenon. Uh, I would say doing it with less than a hundred would be extremely difficult. I would say doing it with uh, a couple of hundred would would, if not straightforward, would uh, would be you know much better. And if you had like up to say 500 genes, I think it would be uh, fairly easy. So there's so there's this sliding scale of you know if you had a thousand or 500 to a thousand genes, I think it would be a fairly accurate representation of the whole uh, exome. Uh, if you get down to uh, say 100 to 200, I think it depends upon uh, which genes are selected and and their particular uh, characteristics. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. And also it depends on how accurate. Yeah, it also depends on how accurate oh, yeah. you want it, or how how similar to TM, you know, the, the existing TMB measurements that you want. Uh, so um, anyway, so sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, we do thank the audience for, for all your questions. A, a lot are are coming in here, um, but unfortunately, we are at a time. Uh, but Q Square would would be happy to address any questions um, following the event. Um, uh, you can certainly uh, get a hold of them, and they will respond uh, with their insights. So we appreciate that. We want to thank our audience again for, for their interest and questions and for participating in today's event. We'd also like to thank Dr. Wendell Jones for his presentation. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, Q Squared Solutions, for making today's education, educational webcast possible. You will receive an email from ACT alerting you to when this webcast will be, be available for replay. We invite you to, jo- to forward the announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.